Hello everyone, thank you for tuning in and welcome back to French Corner Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Eric and we're so glad that you're taking this moment to share with us as we look into the scripture and we continue to look at the life and the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Now last week, or two weeks ago, let me back up two weeks ago, was Thanksgiving week and hope that you and enjoyed and were inspired <clears throat> by the little devotions that our staff gave to you each day during the week. Last week we just were unable to, to get the lesson to you and we apologize for that. So we're going to get into part seven right now of the life and ministry of Paul. And uh, this is the lesson from last week so we can get you caught up here. Let me go ahead and open us up with a word of prayer and then we'll uh, take a look at the scripture for this day. So let's pray together. Father God, we thank you so much for how richly you bless us. We thank you, Father, how you are there for us no matter what. That you are closer than, than even the, the air that, that's around us, Father. Father, you love us and you, you provide for us and you do all things for us even though we're so unworthy. So, Father, we just want to take this moment right here, right now to say thank you so much. We, 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 we couldn't be who we are. We couldn't have what we have. We couldn't aspire to be what we want to be without your presence in our lives, without Christ in our heart, without uh, the, the forgiveness of sin and, and, and salvation and the fact that we are adopted into your family. And Father, we're so thankful that you put this uh, salvation in the Apostle Paul and that you inspired him, Lord, and, and, and sent him to be a missionary to the Gentiles so that we, even today, could hear the gospel of Christ preached and be able to have this, this great life in you. Father, as we have this time now of study, we know that there's so much that's going on in the world. We know, Father, that even right here at home, those that are, are facing health issues, those that are still facing the COVID issues, Father, that there are those that are dealing with loss of loved ones or the impending loss. Father, we know that as we come up on the holiday season, there are those, Lord, that just, um, uh, they, they, they get into the holiday blues. And Father, we pray for each and every one of these. Father, whatever the circumstances, whatever the individual's uh, concern is, Lord God, we pray that you will just bless them and make them whole. But Father, take this word and bless it to our hearts as we read, as we study. And God, we just give you the glory for all things. And it's in Jesus' name that we do pray. Amen and amen. All right. If you've got your Bibles with you, I'd like to invite you to go with me to Acts chapter 13. I'm going to read a few things before we get there, but we're only going to look at three verses today uh, in Acts chapter 13. We're going to begin the study with what I'm calling Section F, Paul's Gospel Message. We've been seeing, we've been talking about, excuse me, his conversion and uh, his preparation for the ministry, but now I want to talk a little bit about the gospel message that he actually presented. As we have established all throughout the New Testament, there is ample providence, evidence, excuse me, of Paul's Jewishness. Author Archibald Hunter describes the apostle in his book, The Gospel According to Paul, as this. Radically Jewish in his attitude to history, Paul, like the prophets, saw it as the meaningful record of God's interventions in history, from creation to consummation. His favorite phrase, in Christ, we can understand only in terms of the Jewish con con conception of corporate personality. Would any but a Hebrew of Hebrews have called Jesus the last Adam? Um, Paul was reared in, in a very strict belief of one God, righteous and holy, in the election of Israel uh, uh, to be God's special people, in the law or the Torah as the unique revelation of uh, God's nature and will for all mankind, and in the hope of a coming Messiah. Paul was raised, he was raised in, in steep Jewish traditional uh, thought and religion. The Apostle Paul, who was a devout follower of Jesus Christ, 
who was once the Pharisee Saul, who was a devout follower of the law, was a Jew living mostly in uh, a Gentile or, or a Greek environment. Um, it was important for him to teach Jewish history, I believe, to those that he uh, uh, that did not know it so that they might understand better uh, that Jesus is the promised Christ. Uh, for those that have no understanding of Jewish history and what is expected of the Messiah, I believe that Paul was so steeped in the Jewish history uh, that, that he wanted to make sure they understood the prophecies so that as Gentiles, as people who were not raised in this way, they would come to truly see that Christ, or Jesus, excuse me, is the Christ, the chosen one, the Messiah. The background of his theology is therefore threefold, Jewish, Greek, and Christian. The gospel that Paul preached was based on seven main topics. First of all, the apostolic preaching of the faith message. Number two, the confession of Jesus, the Messiah, Lord and Son of God. Number three, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit as the divine dynamic of a new life. Number four, the conception of the church as the new Israel. Number five, the sacraments of baptism and Lord's Supper. Number six, uh, the words of the Lord, which Paul quotes or echoes in his letters. And lastly, number seven, the hope of Christ's imminent coming in glory, his return uh, to this earth. So we see here, these are the seven main principles that all of Paul's teaching, the gospel that he preached, all of this uh, is, is categorized under these seven main principles. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 8, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, or Peter, uh, then by the twelve, after... After that, excuse me, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain into the present, but some have fallen asleep, or they have passed away, they've died. After that, he, uh, he was seen by James, and then by all the apostles. Then, last of all, he was seen uh, by me also, as by one born out of due time. Paul knew that the salvation of the Lord... Uh, Paul knew that the salvation of the Lord, or excuse me, is the Lord. I can't read my own writing. Salvation is of the Lord. Paul understood that. He understood it to mean that salvation begins on the divine side uh, with an act of pure grace, which man has done nothing to deserve. So, Salvation is a gift from God, and salvation is an act of divine grace. And salvation begins in God, and it's given to us freely, even though we don't deserve it. He says to us in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, In him you also trusted, after you heard the, truth, the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to praise uh, his glory. The word salvation that Paul uses in this day and time and in his letters, the word salvation signified the well-being of an individual and in all its forms, including the soundness of body to the highest ideal of spiritual health. And, and salvation was, in a sense, um, that <clears throat> which every serious-minded uh, man in Paul's day, uh, Gentile to Jew, were seeking. They were seeking salvation in the well-balanced life. They were seeking the salvation, uh, which is to be fi uh, healthy physically, healthy emotionally, healthy mentally, healthy spiritually. It's, it's a life of pure balance. And that's what people were looking for in Paul's day. For the Jew, salvation would mean primarily deliverance from the sin that separated them from God. 
for the Gentile, it meant deliverance from all the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, from fate to the fear of death uh, to, to the nameless insecurities on which all mortals uh, hold the lease of life. So this was their look in that day of what salvation brought and the deliverance that they were looking for. In the gospel, Paul claimed he had the answer to their longings, the power of God unto salvation. Nothing that he could do, nothing that he could just perform, no miracle of anything that was Paul. He said it is the power of God unto salvation. An answer in terms of the grace of God revealed in the cross of Jesus Christ. A gospel that included not only what man must be saved from, but also what they must be saved to. Which is, of course, reconciliation and righteousness and life in God. Now, we're going to move on to part G. And part G is what we're going to call a threefold salvation. Paul's threefold take on salvation. When Paul thought about Christian salvation, he saw it uh, in having three different tenses. He saw salvation as a past event, a present experience, and a future hope. Those are the three ways that Paul saw salvation. In Romans chapter 8 verse 24, he says we are saved, past tense. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 2, he says we are being saved, the present uh, experience. And then in Romans chapter 5, verse 9, Paul says we shall be saved, future hope. Let's go back and let's, let's listen to Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Paul, uh, this includes all three takes here. Paul says, therefore, having been justified by faith, that's the past, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this great grace in which we stand, that's the present, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God, that's the future. So Paul says this salvation is a very important thing because it's not just something for the, the present. But it completely uh, takes away everything of our past. It is something that dwells in us during the present so that we might experience God and stand and walk in his grace daily. And that the hope of, of salvation to come, that is that we will be with God one day. That we will be raptured by Jesus Christ and brought to heaven to live out all eternity. As Paul thinks of and teaches salvation... He looks back in a, to the time when, by faith, the believer received God's forgiveness in Christ. He dwells on his present blessedness of being in Christ and walking in the newness of life. And he looks forward to the time when sin and death will be no more and we will see God's splendor face to face. Before we actually get into Paul's missionary journeys, we need to understand the message uh, that he brings to those that he encountered. We've looked at his, his take on the gospel message, and we looked at uh, uh, what, 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 um, uh, what he has prepared to do and prepared to preach to the people. But I want us to understand salvation as Paul is going to share it. So let's do that. Salvation as a past event rests on the finished work of Jesus Christ. That is what he did for mankind on the cross. Salvation past is what Jesus did. The work he completed. When he died on the cross, everything was done. Nothing else needs to be done for us to find reconciliation with God. It also looks back at the time when the individual sinner, by the decision of faith, made that deliverance his or her own. Christ died to save mankind from the indwelling sin, that, that radical and, and, and corporate wrongness, which just separates us from a life with God, um, 
this sin nature that brings mankind under God's wrath. Now, a lot of people who don't understand the revelation are people who are not Christians. They, they question how could, if God is so holy and God is so loving and God is so just, how in the world could God bring wrath upon this earth and, and destroy people and kill people? Well, here's, here's how I want to explain it. The wrath that Paul teaches about, the wrath that Jesus came to, to save us from, goes all the way back to John chapter 3, verses six, uh, 17 and 18, when he tells Nicodemus, I did not come into this world to condemn the world, but the world is already condemned. He came to save us from condemnation. So this wrath of God, here's, here's how we're going to define it. The holy love, re, uh, I'm sorry, holy love reacting with righteous judgment against evil. Holy love. Does God want to send anybody to hell? No. Does God want anybody to die without salvation? No. But... When the time comes and the church is raptured and the only ones left on this planet are those that have rejected the salvation gift of Jesus Christ, God's holy love reacts to their um, uh, negativity, to their rejection of Jesus Christ, and that's what the wrath is. It's God's holiness reacting in perfect judgment against those who will reject Jesus Christ as Savior. In Romans chapter 1 verse 18, Paul says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Paul is making it very clear that everything that God does, the wrath that God brings, and, and, and the judgment that he brings upon this earth is in direct result to the ungodliness and the unholiness of mankind. God does not institute wrath. He reacts with wrath. Now, salvation as a present experience is the journey from justification to sanctification. Through Jesus' death on the cross, we are justified. We are, are, are placed before God, in, and presented before God, if you will, uh, as holy and as forgiven. And Jesus says, I have forgiven them and they have asked for this salvation. So we are justified to, to be in a love relationship with God. Now, in our present experience, our salvation moves us from justification into sanctification because, according to Paul, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, God is at work in you. He is at work in me. Sanctification is the continuing path of a spirit-led mortal uh, moral progress, peace and joy, and gift and task. Spirit of God gives us these spiritual gifts, and so therefore we are tasked to use them in a way that brings glory to God. We are to experience the peace and the joy of Jesus Christ. We are to grow in moral progress. All this is a continual movement of the Holy Spirit in our lives after the salvation experience until we die or until we're raptured. So it is a salvation present experience. We are growing. It is spiritual growth. It is coming closer to God. It is knowing him better. It is serving him and worshiping him better. Paul says that because of salvation, believers are presently living, number one, in a new realm, which he says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, we are living in the kingdom of his dear son. Number two, we are standing on a new platform. That goes back to Romans chapter 5, verse 2, which says, by grace we stand. We stand upon the platform of grace. We, number three, we are admitted into God's family. 
which Galatians chapter 4, verse 5, he tells us how we are the adopted sons and daughters of Jesus, of God through Jesus Christ. And number four, we had just we just have a new life indeed. Uh, in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, uh, uh, the free gift of God is eternal life uh, in Jesus Christ. And so we have to remember that this is where we are now. And also Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, he who through faith is righteous shall live. So we see all these great blessings that come upon us because of the salvation now, the, the salvation experience that we have now. Now salvation as a future hope, the to come salvation, uh, can be summed up in three words. Being with Christ. That's our hope. Our hope is that we are going to be with Christ forever. Our hope is that we're going to dwell with Christ forever. Our hope is that we are going to forever be in his presence and we will never be able to be removed from his presence. In his book, Man in Revolt, from 1939, Emil Bruner wrote, To be a Christian is to share something that has happened, which is happening, and which will happen. Our concern now is with what is going to happen, the consummation of the new life of man in Christ. Christ is already risen and Christ already reigns. He is the first fruits of all that God, uh, of, uh, of the dead that shall be brought to life by God. What happened to Jesus Christ will happen to all of us, everyone that is his. We are going to live out eternity as joint heirs of Jesus Christ. And if we have, according to Romans chapter 6 verse 8, died with him, we believe also that we shall live with him. A future hope, being with Christ. Paul also told the church at Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 17, so shall we be always with the Lord. What a great promise that he gives to us. And this hope is not only of being with Christ, but it is also being like Christ. Because Paul tells us that the Christian's destiny, according to Romans chapter 8 and verse 29, is that we will be shaped to the likeness of the Son of God. So this is our future. This is what our salvation is. Christ died and, and, and has given us an event of forgiveness of sins. We have a current hopeful, I mean, I'm sorry, a current uh, experience of salvation as we grow in the Spirit each and every day. And then we have the hope of the future that we are going to be given everything that God has promised to us in the form of Jesus Christ. In short, Paul's teaching of the doctrine of salvation really has two main components. That God the Father is the source and that the mediator is Jesus Christ. Paul declares in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 6, Yet for us there is one God the Father of whom all things uh, and, we for, and we for him and one Lord Jesus Christ through whom are all things and through whom we live. Now, of Paul's teachings, Archibald Hunter, let's go back to him. He also says this. We may say two things. First, Paul's teaching assures us that the personality is renewed in the future life, not as a ghost, but with all that is needed for its self-expression and power to communicate with others. Second, it avoids the drawbacks of both Greek and the popular Jewish views of the afterlife. In the Greek doctrine, the immortality of the disembodied soul secured spiritually, but endangered personal identity. And the Jewish doctrine of an embodied life conceived as it was mostly in fleshly terms, preserved identity, but imperiled 
spirituality. So in Paul's day, like I said, as the Jew and the Greek looked for salvation, it wasn't complete, it wasn't whole. As the salvation they looked for, some other aspect of life was going to be impaired for the greater good. But Paul's teaching is everything can be saved and everything can be taken care of in the name of Jesus Christ. Now we're going to go ahead and move into part H of the study, which is Paul's journeys. We know that there is a record of his three missionary journeys. There is the record of his journey to Jerusalem for the Jerusalem Council, and then we have his journey to Rome. And we're going to take time to look at all these. But before we do, let's go to Acts chapter 13. Here's the verses where I wanted you to, to look at or, or get ready uh, at the beginning of our study. And, and, and I want us to explore the origins uh, of, of Paul's ministry. Uh, the, the first missionary journey is found in Acts chapter 13, verse 1, through Acts chapter 14, verse 28. And, and, but, but to do what he did, he had to be set apart. To do what he did, he had to be sent out. And that's what I want us to read right now. So Acts chapter 13, the first three verses say, Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, uh, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and sent them away. Let's just take a minute or two and just study these three verses uh, for just a moment. Acts is an incredible record. Uh, for us concerning the history of the church. Um, chapters 1 through 7 can be called uh, the church among the Jews. Chapters 8 through 12 could be called the church in transition, going from Jewish to Gentile. And then Acts uh, chapters 13 through 28 could be called the church among the Gentiles. So we see this transition that is taking place in the book of Acts as we see the work of the apostles. Um, it is from the church here at Antioch of Syria, or Syrian Antioch, that the missionary work to the Gentile nation actually begins. It is here that there was a Jewish Christian church already organized, but by the time we get to Acts chapter 13, that has already begun to spill out to some of the Gentiles in uh, Antioch and in the region of Syria. And as you remember, Paul uh, Barnabas excuse me, was sent by uh, the disciples in Jerusalem to go and to see everything that was going on to report on the things going on in Antioch. And Antioch was really not that far from Tarsus. And Barnabas was the one who stood up for Paul and told the disciples in Jerusalem, he has truly been saved. So he sends word to Paul in Tarsus and said, look, Gentiles are getting saved and, and, and this is right up your alley. This, this is your expertise. And I really could use your help here uh, in Antioch of Syria. So Paul comes down and he stays there a whole year helping Barnabas there at Antioch. So in these three verses, we're going to uh, uh, see uh, that... that um, uh, let, me, let me tell you what Pastor John Lowe says. Pastor John Lowe says about Syrian Antioch, thus the mother church of Gentile Christianity had become the seminary of the mission to the Gentiles. Um, not only was Antioch a place with these great spiritual teachers and prophets, but it was also the place where uh, Christians were first called Christians there at Antioch. Prophets were a regular part of the ministry of the church at the time. Teachers appear to have differed from the prophets in that the prophets received this direct word from God and they would preach and they would tell of impending dangers or they would tell of a revelation that has come directly to them via the Holy Spirit. And then your teachers are more so of the ones that would actually teach 
uh, uh, the doctrines. To sit down with people and say, now this is what baptism is. This is what the observance of the Lord's Supper is. This is what it means to, to love one another. These five men that are mentioned here uh, in this passage are uh, the leadership of Antioch. Uh, the five men named are not to be regarded only as a part, but as the whole body of the prophets and teachers of Antioch, in keeping with the idea that the Holy Spirit has made this selection. Now, to which individuals were considered prophets and which ones were considered teachers, we don't know the designation. We're not, all, we're not really sure. What we do know is that each of these five are to be considered as ministers of the gospel in no particular rank or no particular order. Well, we're going to be running out of time here, so we're going to have to pick this back up in our next study, um, which will be tomorrow at 11 o'clock a.m. So we hope that you tune back tomorrow at 11 o'clock so that we can uh, finish this study and see about this leadership here at Antioch. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We appreciate it. Glad to have you. Let me close us in a word of prayer. Father, again, we devote ourselves to you. We devote ourselves to the study of your word, and we ask, Father, for the clarity of your word, and, Father, the inspiration through the life of Paul and all the others that are mentioned in the scripture, so that we might be more like you. But most of all, let us be like Jesus, Father, and to be moved by him. And thank you again for his salvation, your salvation, made possible through the cross at Calvary. Amen. Thank you again for spending the time with us. Be safe and be blessed, and we'll see you here tomorrow at 11 a.m. Thank you so much.